Okay, hi everybody. I'm Scott Stanchfield and uh, we're going to talk about our uh, command pattern for the design pattern series. This is our fourth session. Uh, I'm getting a little bit more people each time, so it looks like people are saying, hey, that's a pattern I don't know, as opposed to you know, the first couple, which you know everybody knew what was going on there. Um, so this is who I am, Scott Stanchfield. My email is scott at javadude.com or scott.stanchfield at jhuapl.edu. Uh, this website here is where I host all the videos for this lecture series. So every time I, I come and do one of these, I record it, throw the video up uh, uh, somewhere, I think Vimeo, and then uh, put a link here. That link leads you to this page here, which will have all the videos listed. So I've, so far we've done one which is kind of an intro and talked about you know really naive GUIs and the mediator pattern. Then I talked about observer pattern and Java Beans, and then I talked about model view controller. I'm going to assume a little bit of knowledge of model view controller for this session, but not a whole lot. Uh, each of these, the uh, the source code is also available as a Git repository, so you can actually use it and then check out different tags, and you can walk through the examples that I'm doing inside here. Uh, all the code here I've re I'm releasing as Apache 2. <coughs> so let's talk about why we want to use the command pattern. Anytime you have a model object or just an object that has data inside it, you need to manipulate that data somewhere. And I'm going to call them those manipulations operations. The operations can be simple things like getting data or they can be changing data. And changing data is really what we want to focus on here. To start with, we have what I call primitive, well, what everybody calls primitive operations. And a primitive operation is the most basic operation you need to manipulate your data. If all you have are primitives on your model, then you can do everything with your data behind the scenes. Core or necessary operations. So let's start off by taking a look at a really simple bank account type situation here. And I'm not going to go into transactions or anything. I'm going to have a couple spots marked where, you're gonna, where it's going to say begin a transaction here, end a transaction. But I'm not going to get into how you do those for this session. We're going to start with a nice simple account object here. And this account object, I'm starting off with the observer pattern stuff that I talked about a couple lectures ago. And all this is going to do is allow somebody to register with this account saying, let me know when you change. Whenever that changes, we're going to get a property change event sent to him. So that's using the observer pattern. I have two pieces of data in this account, an ID and a balance. And I'm just representing this in whole dollars. Uh, if I were doing this in real life, I'd probably represent that as cents because you really don't want to use floats to keep track of money due to imprecision. And then I have a getter for it to get the ID, and I have a getter for the balance down here. I don't know why I put it down there, but I did. So I have a getter for the ID and the balance so you can retrieve the data. The interesting things happen when I want to change the data. And in this case, I don't have a set balance or a set ID. Once the ID is set, it's locked down. Once the balance is set, the only way you can change it is by asking to deposit or asking to withdraw. <coughs> now, you'll notice that these guys here are firing property change events for the balance because that's something they do. Now, what we saw in the observer pattern lecture was that when you called set something, like set balance, we would fire a property change for balance, which makes sense. You set the balance, it changes it. This is one where as a side effect of this method, it changes the property. So we need to make sure that we fire those change events to let people know that certain properties have changed. You're going to see this big time a little bit later where there's a whole bunch of properties get changed by one method. Now in these two, two examples here, deposit keeps track of the old balance, updates the balance, and then fires the property change to say the balance has changed. Similar for withdraw, we I, I put a little, real simple st stupid check in here to just say, you know, throw insufficient funds as an exception. Uh, I don't have anything in the rest of the examples checking for that, so that's something we're just going to avoid during these examples. Get the old balance, change the balance, fire the property change. So far, so good. So it's a fairly simple little bank object here. Now I'm going to create a user interface for him, and this is where the model view controller came in handy. What I was doing in this is I have a model that I keep track of. It's going to be what's represented in this user interface on the screen. I have a couple fields representing his data. I'm going to set up the UE here. And so this is just defining a little simple UE with an account number and balance and then fields to represent them on the screen. And then I'm going to set up a listener so that when the model is attached to me, anytime the model changes, I'm going to update my user interface. 
this is where model view controller really shines is that once I've set this up, I don't have to worry about it ever again. I can change the model outside of this user interface and it'll get updated automatically inside this user interface. So my listener in this case is just a little lambda here saying call update fields. And update fields just says set the num field and the balance field to the data from the model. In my little set model here, just as a refresher from last week, the first thing I want to check is was I already connected to a model? If so, disconnect because I don't want to be connected to two models at once, that would be really bad. Set my model, and then if I'm now connected to a model, go ahead and attach to it. And then I'm going to listen for changes in him. Whoops. Now the overall user interface for this is a panel that's just going to include two accounts at the top. So I'm going to drop in two account UEs for two different account objects. And then I'm going to put some buttons in there that let me deposit and withdraw $10 from either account. So really, really crude interface, but it just it's useful to get the point across what's going on here. I just set up this little My Button class so that I can pass in uh, the label for the button and the action to perform on the button in one place. So I didn't have to do that. So that's all he's doing down there. And then finally, the sample just says create the UE and put it on the screen. So let's take a look at how this guy works. We'll see that we have our little, here's an account UE up here, here's another account UE over here for, bank, for account one, count two. I'm going to deposit $10 to the first account, deposit $10 to the second account, withdraw, withdraw. So it seems to be doing what we wanted it to do. So we're just kind of starting with a really simple model here and some basic operations, the deposit and withdraw. Any questions so far? So the next thing we're going to do is add on macro operations. A macro operation combines or is a composition of multiple other operations. So it could use primitives, it could use other macros. So just down in the diagram here, I have all these primitives in my model. This macro might use these two primitives. This macro might only use one. This one might use a macro as well as a primitive to do his operation. And this way you can build up more and more complex operations. This is sometimes a convenience. So maybe the model itself didn't provide extra functionality. But a lot of times what you're really trying to do is provide some kind of batching or transaction mechanism. So you're trying to group things and be able to capture the whole thing in a transaction. That's one of the places where a macro is very, very useful. You can say at the start, top of the macro, start my transaction, do whatever you need to do, and then end your transaction at the end of the macro. And the nice thing about using a macro for that is the caller doesn't have to worry about that. Let's say you want to do a bank transfer. The caller wouldn't have to remember, oh, I got to start a transaction, do the withdraw from one, do the deposit from the other, and then end the transaction. They can just call the macro, and he does all that for him. So let's see what happens when we add a macro here. So here's my new transfer macro. Real simple little class here. All I'm doing is creating a do transfer method, and it's external to my model object. So he gets passed in two accounts. He says, withdraw from one, deposit in the other, and do transaction mess around it. Make sense? So fairly simple thing here. So what I did in my sample now, in my bank UE, is I added in two more buttons, transfer $10. And what I'm going to do is use a transfer macro I'm just holding on to here to actually call do transfer to, to move the money. Simple little operation. If I run him again here, we'll see the two new buttons. I can deposit some money here, and I can say transfer, and we see the operations happening just fine. I can transfer the other direction as well. Okay, so this is kind of a rough way to encapsulate that functionality of the transfer. Question so far? Let's get a little bit prettier on this. What I'm going to do is use something called the command pattern, and it basically takes that macro functionality and puts a single API on top of it. The single API in this case has an execute command. So instead of having to have every macro have its own parameter set, we're going to just have an execute. When you create an instance of that command, you're going to pass in the data you need for it. Now, it doesn't sound a whole lot different until you start thinking about how you can use this thing. And the way I like to, to think about this the most is that the user can customize. You know how in, like, in Microsoft Office you can rearrange things on the, the ribbon and the toolbars? The user can you know, just drag things here and there, or delete things they don't want. That's what I'm talking about here. What you can do is let the user 
decide which commands I'm going to associate with which key presses, toolbar actions, mouse gestures, whatever, or even command line interface. To do that, the simplest thing we can do is to create something called an action. And an action allows you to, I should have had these guys appear later. <laughs> the action allows you to create instances of the commands and then run them. So you have kind of a one-to-many relationship. One action gets attached to the UE, you know, whether it's a key press or a toolbar or whatever. And when he's invoked, he creates an instance of a command and executes it. So you have multiple command objects, one action object. Make sense? Sometimes people get those confused. Yeah. So what this is, is, is on the button, the actual click action, you're going to put that action in there. So in, in the examples I'm going to do here, action actually implements action listener. You could do it some, using some other interface if you wanted to. But the idea is this is something you can just plug into a button or plug into a, a key press or a toolbar or whatever. And when you do it, it runs the action performed on this action object. You could have an execute method on there, however you want to word it. But it's basically this is the event handler. Okay. Now, as a little example, let's say we want to implement a rename command for some object. We could create a command called change name command. He's going to take in the model object and the new name, because those are the parameters we need to actually run our operation. Uh, the user can assign a change name action to a toolbar, key press, whatever. Maybe we display a dialog to get the parameters that the user is going to ask for. So when they hit that change name, the action brings up a dialog first and says, what's a new name? user types in a name, hits OK, it creates an instance of the command, passes in the model, passes in the new name, and then runs the command. You can also invoke these from the command line. So you could have a slightly different action that takes command line parameters and then invokes the command. So this way, the command itself, the thing that's actually doing the change of your data, doesn't change. The actions are really the interpretation of what the user is doing and how to affect the model by calling commands. So let's take a look at one of these guys. And I'm not going to do the user customization part of it, but I'll talk you through that in a second here. So in this version of the, uh, the interface here, you'll see that now I have deposit action, withdraw action, transfer action added to the buttons. So those are my listeners now. Think about this section here where I'm adding, and adding buttons. I could create a little interface that allows the user to dynamically do those adds and removes at runtime. That's one of the things that's nice about a little bit of abstraction there. The user can then end up rearranging the GUI at runtime. We could read a file that had this stuff saved from the last time the user did their job and then recreate all these buttons with the actions on them. So that's the setup there. Let's take a look at what an action might look like. So I'm going to start off with deposit action here. And I'm just using the uh, AWT Action Listener interface. It comes with Java. And they use that in AWT and Swing. And all he's got inside of him, hey, that's helpful, isn't it? Can I fix that real quick? This is what happens when your computer blows up on you and you have to rebuild it. Oh, come on. And JDK. Switch over to him. And now, hey, I said, and now, yeah, he doesn't want to do that for me, does he? Huh. I made that default, and he is not... Maybe that's what the deal is. Okay, well, that is not going on for me. Let's see if I can find it this way. There he is. So this is the interface for Action Listener. He just has a single method, and that's why I can use it as a lambda, because he has a single method inside of him. And that action performed is the thing I'm going to do in response to the button press. So my deposit action defines what action performed is. And you'll see that all he does is create a new command passing in the data that he needs and then executes it. The deposit action 
In this case, I'm hardwiring what the idea of this action is, which account I'm going to affect and how much I'm going to deposit each time. Withdraw, command, withdraw action is the same type of thing. He just calls withdraw command instead. Transfer action, a little more complex because you've got two accounts to keep track of. But again, he just creates a transfer command and then calls execute on it. Okay, so far? So you have multiple of these commands being created. Right now, the multiple commands don't really do anything for us because we execute them and we throw them away. The next step we're going to do is we're going to keep track of those. But for right now, let's see how this actually runs. <coughs> oh, actually, I didn't show you the command interface. So here's the command interface. He has execute. And now the deposit command has account.deposit instead of having that action hard-coded in my UI. So now it's been encapsulated in this command object. And similar for transfer command, let's have my to and from. Here's that logic that I used to have over in the, the uh, uh, user interface. And let's go ahead and run this guy. It should do the same thing we did before. Can withdraw. I can transfer. I can transfer the other way. So everything's still working the same way. Okay. So we get a little bit of an extra value out of this in that we can customize our user interface. Now you're not always going to do that though. So there's another big benefit to the command pattern. And that is when we start talking about undo and redo. What we can do with the command pattern here is if we add on an undo and a redo method on our command interface. We have instructions for how to do the action, that's our execute, instructions for how to undo it, instructions for how to redo it. Most of the time redoing is just calling execute, you're just doing that again. But once in a while you get yourself in a state where you might do some expensive computation during an execute and you don't want to redo that ex expensive computation every time, so you just hold the result and then redo uses that result again. So you just don't have to recompute it. Or maybe there's something that is uh, temporal. So maybe it depends on when you execute it, you have to do something a little bit different. In that case, the redo might have different code than the execute. In order to do an undo, we need to keep track of previous state so we can go back. Now for a bank account, that's pretty simple, right? All you got to do is say, if I'm doing a deposit, my undo is what? This is withdraw, right? So it's like my, if I do a deposit, I can undo it using a withdraw and vice versa. Transfer, similar type of thing. Instead of withdrawing from one account and transferring to the other, you swap them. Okay. Now the undo manager is the guy who keeps track of all this stuff for us. And he has two stacks inside of him, an undo stack and a redo stack. So that whenever we execute something, we're going to push it on the undo stack. If we hit undo, we can pop it off the undo stack, run its undo, and push it on the redo stack. And this way we just keep track of anything we want to undo and redo. Now, depending on how your app is and how much memory you have, you're probably going to want to limit the size of these stacks. So maybe say, OK, I'll keep at most 100 objects or 1,000 commands, depending on what you want to do. Sometimes you can collapse the commands. Like I wrote one recently where if I'm pushing a command on the stack, that's the same as one that's already there, I can combine them together into one action. So for example, if uh, you have a user interface where as you type, every letter you type is executing a command to change a value, if you're pushing those on the stack, you know, add an A, add a B, add a C, add a D, you can collapse those into add A, B, C, D at the end of it. And that can be real useful and very efficient, and it's actually pretty nice for the user. Think about what the user's doing. They type in ABCD. If they hit undo, they probably are thinking undo everything I just typed, you know, all the changes I made to this particular field, as opposed to remove the D, remove the C, remove the B, remove the A. I've, had, I've used some tools that do that, and it's really frustrating because you have to hit undo a billion times to do anything. So collapsing is kind of nice. Uh, so the undo manager, when you call execute, it's going to push on the undo stack. So... Here's an example. I'm just, I just uh, called execute passing in command 1, and I push command 1 on the undo stack. I'm going to call execute pushing command 2 on the undo stack. Now let's say I do one more command, and then I want to undo it. When I call undo on the undo manager, he pops that guy off 
and pushes them on the redo stack. So now I'm in a state where I can redo the last undone thing or undo one more time. Let's undo one more time. Boom. So now we have our uh, redo stack has C3, C2. Our undo stack has C1. Note that the idea here is that my state of my system is that only C1 has ever been executed. So if I undo, C1 will go away. If I redo, C2 gets re-executed because he was the next thing that I was doing. So let's do a redo. Boom. We call redo on him, push him back on the undo stack. Now this is where it gets a little interesting. What happens if I execute something brand new that I've never seen before? Is there anything special that I have to do? Well, take a look at these stacks for a minute. I have never executed C3 yet. Let's say I execute C4. Now my sequence of events is C1, C2, C4. What would happen if I left that C3 on the redo stack and said redo? It's changing the order of things that I've done, right? And when I did C1, C2, C3, my assumption when I did C3 is that I had already done C1 and C2 and nothing else. Now for some commands, that might not be a problem. But depending on what you're changing, let's say that these are insert characters at a certain position. That could cause us all sorts of grief, right? So if these are all saying insert a character at position 1, position 2, position 3, and let's say I pushed one more guy on here, if I redid this, it's going to insert at position 3 instead of position 4. It's going to be in bad shape. So what you do is any time you execute something, you clear your redo stack. And the idea there is pretty simple. I've never been there before. I've basically decided I've gone back and I'm taking a different path of action. So I'm going to completely forget the path of action that I started to go on and throw that away. It's kind of similar if you're browsing. The undo stack and the redo stack are very similar to your back stack and your forward stack. So anytime you go back a page, it pushes it on the back stack. Anytime you go forward a page, it's, uh, it uh, pushes it on the forward, page, forward stack. So you can swap back and forth between those two guys going back and forth. So in this case, if I did an execute for C4, we clear that redo stack. And so now we have C1, C2, C4. Make sense? So let's come back over here. And take a look at what all this stuff looks like now. So my command interface now has, in this case, I put an extra method called get name so I can get some descriptive information and be able to represent that when I'm asking people to undo or redo. I have execute, undo, and redo on my command interface. Let's take a look at a deposit command now. My deposit command keeps track of the things he's going to interact on, so the parameters he needs. And I have execute, undo, and redo. So execute does the deposit, undo does the withdraw, redo, I'm just going to call execute. I'm not doing any expensive computations. If I were, I could hold on to it and then redo it. One thing that sometimes you can also do is instead of having it look like this, I could say keep track of my old amount. And then in my execute, I could say this dot old amount equals amount oh, uh, equals account dot get balance, something like that. And then if my object allowed me to set the balance directly, which in this model it doesn't, but if it did, my undo could just say account dot set balance to the old balance or the old amount instead of doing the withdraw. This is one of those places where maybe account dot get balance took a lot of computation so I don't want to keep executing it every time. In that case my redo could now just do the deposit, right? and save that fetch of the old one because I'm holding on to the data. So that might be an example of how the, uh, the redo might be different than the undo. But I can't do this because my model doesn't allow that set balance, right? So we'll get those out of there. And we're back to this. So execute, we're in deposit. Undo, we're going to withdraw. Redo, we're just going to do the exact same thing we did execute. 
this happens probably 99.99% of the time. It's very rare you're going to find a case where you really need a different redo. So what happens a lot of times is people create a common superclass that just defines redo as calling execute. And if somebody wants to, they can explicitly override it. Otherwise, they just leave it as is. Now the get name is going to say down here, return deposit amount into account, blah, blah, blah. So it's just a descriptive name to describe what this command is actually going to be doing for us. Withdraw command, exactly the same, except I'm swapping the withdraw and the deposit. That's all, all we're doing there. Transfer command, very, very similar. Execute goes one direction. Withdraw from one, deposit the other. Undo goes the opposite direction. Redo just calls execute again. So those are the command objects, similar to before, but we added those undo and, and uh, redos. The fun part comes in the undo manager here. And this, again, I'm adding in my support to notify people when things change, exactly the same as before. I'm going to keep track of two stacks, undo and redo. And these two stacks are going to allow me to do the push and the pop going back and forth. I set up a, where's my old state guy? There he is. I set up a little class here called old state to keep track of the properties before and after undos. So old state is going to keep track the redo name, the undo name, or whether uh, what was the name of the uh, undo about to be done, the name of the redo about to be undone, and then if I can undo or redo. If we take a look down here, is undo available? Just says if I have anything on my stack, there's an undo available. If I have anything on my redo stack, there's a redo available. The names are going to be used so I can put those on the menu or a button or something. So it'll say undo and then list the action rather than just saying the word undo or redo. And that's actually kind of a nice touch for the user. So the user can say, well, what is undo going to do? <clears throat> so he's just going to say, if I have an undo, peek at the first item and get his name. If I have a redo, peek at the first item and get his name. So now the fun stuff, in my execute, you have to make sure you're going to do a try catch around this. You, you want to you know, try to grab whatever the result is, if there's a problem, and log it, report it. Don't just log it. That's kind of a bad thing. You don't want to swallow those. In this case, I'm just swallowing it just for the example to show you what's going on there. First thing I'm going to do is track my old state. So I'm getting those old values of the names and the... Um, uh, the availability. Then I'm going to call execute on the command, push it to the undo stack, and clear the redo stack. That's my execute logic. Finally, I'm going to fire changes so that anybody listening to the undo manager can report, oh, now there's undos available or not, and here's the names of those undos and redos. Undo, we're going to first of all say, if I have anything to undo, capture my old state, and pop the item off the undo stack. So I'll keep track of it. Call undo on him, and then push him over on the redo stack. Once again, fire my changes to let anybody know that the state of the undo manager has changed. Redo, fairly simple, so, so fairly similar to everything else here. If there's anything on the redo stack, save the old state, pop off the redo stack, call redo, push it on the undo stack, and then fire my changes. Fire changes just goes through four property changes. So this is what I was mentioning before, where one operation, in this case the redo operation, can affect multiple properties. And so we're going to tell people in the outside world that all these properties have potentially changed. Behind the scenes, fire property change will only actually fire the event if the old value and the new value are different. So if you know something available didn't change, it won't fire the event. Yes. I just made that in here. So this is a uh, just a real simple little class here. I just made it as an inner class that just grabs each of the current values. And then that way I can just take a look at them. <coughs> okay, so that is my undo manager. Really not a whole lot going on here, but what's really cool is that using this technique, you get your undo and redo pretty much for free. Just by encapsulating the actions you want inside those command objects, and defining the inverses of them, that undo, you get this functionality for very, very low cost. And it's easy to implement. 
Now back in the bank UI, we're still doing the same type of things. We're calling these deposit and withdraw and transfer actions. But I added in a parameter, the undo manager. So if we take a look, I'm grabbing onto that undo manager. And now instead of me calling new deposit command.execute, I create the command and I just pass it over to the undo manager to do his job. He executes it, pushes it on the stack, and sets it up for undo and redo. Now the rest of this UE, I'm going to add a property change listener to the undo manager so I can listen for is there any undo or redo available. And all this update buttons is going to do is take these two buttons that I'm adding to my user interface up here, and I'm going to make them visible based on is there an undo or redo available. So you'll see these two buttons appear and disappear on the GUI. And then I'm going to set the text to be whatever the undo name or the redo name is, plus the word undo and redo in front of it. Okay, and let's go ahead and run this guy. So here's my, two user my new user interface. Notice at the bottom down here, there's a blank space. Those are two buttons that are not currently visible. The layout manager is still giving them space, but the buttons just aren't presented to us because there's no undo and redo available. I decided to go this way rather than setting up menus and kind of getting cloudy and, and all that set up. Uh, but typically what you do is you'd have a menu item that would just be ghosted and it would just say undo and it would be kind of gray. And then once there's an undo available, it would change the menu item to say undo whatever the action is. So I'm going to deposit $10 into account one, and you see that immediately this button appears down here. So this account got updated, it updated its UE, put, it went through the undo manager, the undo manager fired the property changes, we, up, we updated that button on the screen. Let's undo that, boom. We go back to balance zero, and now you notice the undo button's gone because there's nothing on the undo stack. The redo button is there because of the redo stack is available. If I do a redo, boom, goes back, and the undo button comes up. Let's say that I'm in this redo state and I deposit a new $10. Boom, my redo stack gets cleared as part of that action. So let's throw some money into these accounts, do some withdrawals. I can undo, redo, and everything's working just fine. Now I can do transfer, undo the transfers, nice and simple. So this pattern, while being a simple pattern, buys you a lot. And you can use it in a GUI, you can use it on a website, you can use it in a command line, whatever. Now with a website, it's not as useful because the user isn't usually keeping track of the state of what's going on on the website. Usually you send a request to the website, it performs the action and sends you the results. You could use this on a website to allow that undo type action, but you want to make sure you keep track of that per user. So keep track of it in your session as opposed to for the global website, because that would be kind of bad. You know, One user does something, the other one user undoes it, eh, maybe not working all that well. The thing you have to be really careful about though is that when you say undo and redo, you're assuming states. You know, what was my last state? So you have to have enough user separation that you're not going to have two users stepping on each other that way. Because if one user undoes something and one user does something, and then this first person redoes, the redo assumes the state. But this other user did something in the middle. So if the users aren't isolated in their data that they're modifying, you could have some problems there. Just be careful of that. Um, now, one place I used this recently is I was doing an Android app where on the tablet, as you type things in, it runs a command for every letter that you, you execute. And the model object behind the scenes is actually updating the database for every character you type. That way, if the, ex if the app gets crashed or anything, everything is saved at that point, rather than saving things in memory and then flushing the database once in a while. And uh, I tried it on a whim, and the performance was just fine. I thought it was going to be horrible, but every get and set was translated into database access, and it worked. And I was like, wow, <laughs> I'm going to eventually change it so it batches things, but hey, it worked out great and you know stopped us from having some problems that we had before. Uh, so using the commands, I was able to collapse those change commands into one for the user field. The user gets those undo and redo buttons, 
which when they when I put out the new version of the app with the undo and redo, they loved it. Because, you know, they'd, they'd randomly, you know, enter data in the wrong field and be like, ah, oh, crap. And then, you know, what do I do? And then, oh, you just hit undo. Poof. Nice and beautiful. And then that calls the corresponding sets, which changes the database again. And everything's peachy. Okay. So that is the command pattern. Nice and simple. You get a lot of benefit out of it. Um, and uh, let's see, what was the other thing I wanted to say about this? No, I think that was pretty much it. I, I'm thinking in the back of my head there was something I'm missing to say here, but probably not. Cause it's probably just usually because I follow this up with another pattern afterwards. Okay, any questions on that? Yes? De yeah, so the question was, for doing the command compression, would the decorator pattern help there? It depends on how you implement it. Now, there is actually in Swing that Java has built into it, they do something kind of similar to the uh, command pattern, but they call it an undoable action. And the, the, the thing that's weird about that is it's really something that happens after the fact, as opposed to being, you don't create an object up front to represent what to do. You create an object to represent, a route object after you execute to say how to undo it, which I really don't like that approach because it has kind of a separation of concerns, um, a bad separation of concerns. The uh, They also have this, uh, what do they call it, a compound command or a compound undoable action, I think is what they call it, that will do something similar to that. It actually is a wrapper that has several commands inside of it. Uh, what I like to do for it, and, and similar to what I did here, is I had a void... Or actually, a boolean um, is collapsible. Oops. Which, first of all, the command can say, "Can I be collapsed?" Passing in another command. So you'll say, "What the guy on the on the stack? I'm about to push this guy. Can I collapse you to by using this this new guy's coming on there?" And then I have a Void collapse, passing in a command. And you could combine this into one action. That'd be fine. And then just say collapse it, returning a Boolean. And if that returns true, then I'm already collapsed. I like separating them out. This I think it's a little more readable. So you first of all add those guys in there. Let's say for deposit command is collapsible. I'm going to say return command instance of, actually, let's uh, be a little more specific, get class equal equal deposit command dot class. And then the collapse, I'm just going to say, let's add the amounts together for what we're depositing. See, this guy want to do it? Yeah, you have to do it after you've executed. So this guy will say amount plus equals Something like that. What does he not like here? Void command. Oh, you know that? No, I did save it. Oh, I didn't save that. Thank you. There we go. That's better. So this would say I can collapse if the new guy being pushed on is a deposit command. And I can do something similar for my withdraw command. So what this should do is if you do two deposits in a row, it'll, it should collapse them together. Transfer command, I'm going to say, let's not make him be collapsible. We could, but let's just, for sake of showing a difference here, just say false. And then this guy just doesn't need to do anything because he's never going to be called. 
So let's take a look at our undo manager. And what we want to do is say on the execute, <coughs> we're going to execute the command. But before we do this push, I'm going to say if undo stack dot peak dot is collapsible with this new command, then I'm going to say collapse it. Else something like that. And so what this should let me do is do a multiple uh, um, uh, uh, deposits in a row and undo them all as one thing. Let's see if that actually worked. So I'm going to deposit 10, 20, 30, 40. Whoa, hello, crash! Empty stack exception. Oh, hey, you know, it would be nice if I had a little check for that. If is undo available and little minor details like that. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. And you notice how the undo deposit is changing there? I, I got that for free because I'm changing the command there. Okay, so now I can do undo deposit 90 and boom, or redo deposit 90. So this allows us to collapse those similar commands, which depending on what you're trying to do in your user interface can actually be very nice for the user. You, know, you can save them a lot of control Z's. They can just kind of collapse them all together. A lot of painting tools will do this. You know, as you, if you do a bunch of new paint strokes with one certain tool, it might collapse them. Uh, that would drive my son nuts. He's an animator, and he likes to be able to, every single stroke, individually, do undo. It's kind of neat watching him do his thing, because he will he has he uses a graphics tablet, and so he'll sweep to draw a line, and if he doesn't like it, undo, sweep again, undo, sweep again. So you might see, if you're watching him do it, this line appear and disappear several times until he likes the way it looks and then goes with it. And uh, it's it's really useful for him. I think his, his pinky is going to go numb from holding control that much. So I'm hoping that on the tablet he's actually assigned an undo button. Uh, I have to mention that to him. Say, do you have an undo button set up on your tablet because you're going to kill your pinky? Um, but that actually, this collapsing, can be very useful. It's especially good if you're tracking individual keystrokes because you really don't want the user to have to undo every single keystroke. So that's an example of how you might uh, collapse things. Now you could also create a composite command that keeps track of them. And the composite command, it'd be a little bit different here. Um, let's see. Because what you want, the well, you could either explicitly put things into the composite command and execute several to get together. Let me just show you how that might look real quick. New. Oops. Uh, actually, let's do this like this. Anything special I have to do for my undo here? Reverse order. Real key here. Just make sure that looks okay. We'll say he's not collapsible. Um, yeah, let's say command sub zero dot get name. 
you can probably come up with a better way to represent that. But I didn't want to like put brackets and have a list with comma separated because that's not going to mean anything to a user, right? Um, it might make more sense actually to say to do something like this because you're really describing an entirely new type of command. So we can just say return name. So you have to explicitly give it a name. Okay, so here's just a generic composite command. This requires you to plan in advance how you want to batch things. So I could use this in place of my transfer command, right? Although one thing I want to do is make sure I say Whatever transaction manager I'm using, make sure I start and end my transaction around this. Which is one of the few things that I actually have a use for Spring. I'm not a fan of Spring because it just hides so much behind the scenes and debugging is a nightmare. Um, but using it to wrap transactions is actually pretty nice. You can just at the method level say this is transactional. Uh, okay, so that looks good. And then what we could do is in the bank UE, actually in the transfer action, that's what I want to do. So in the transfer action, instead of executing a transfer command, I can build it up here. So I could say composite command transfer amount from, I'm just going to abbreviate this a little bit here. To, ah, come on fingers. It's been a long night. <laughs> uh, and then the commands that I want to execute. So I'm going to say new withdraw command from amount. Oh, come on. I said from. Don't tell me I didn't. And then deposit command to. Something like that. And then boom. So this makes it so you don't have to constantly create new commands to do composite actions. You can use just a generic composite command and have your action build it up for you. you know, or maybe a factory build it up if you wanted to. So now I can say, let's try putting some money in and let's see if that transfer is going to work. Hey, it worked. Yay. I love it when things work the first time. Doesn't always happen, but sometimes it does. Um, so that gives you another tool here to, to, to effectively use these commands so you can build them up on the fly without having to create whole new classes every single time. Make sense? Okay. So that's the idea of the command pattern. And actually kind of snuck in a little of the composite pattern there, but we'll talk about that more either next week or the week after. I, I think it's coming up soon. Any other questions? So instead of an undo redo, how would you use it to make a configurable UI? Well, let's, let me get a, do I have a, I don't have a pen, a graphics tablet here. Uh, basically what we do is we create a little user interface that the user has a little customized button. That would pop up a user interface. It might look like, well, let me just pull up Word. I think Word's get, Word does a pretty good job of this. So over here, we have this customize uh, quick access toolbar. Um, you can pick and choose things that you want to show up on the toolbar here. So you have the little undo and redo buttons. We can say more, oh, yeah, 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 I'll fix you later. Uh, we can say more commands. This might be a pretty nice version of what your, your uh, user interface customizer looks like. So what you do is you list the types of commands you have available. So you keep track of all the commands that you support. Each one of those, when the user drags it over to a toolbar or drags it onto the little quick access bar up here, when you do that, what you're doing behind the scenes is you're going to create an instance of an action that creates him and attach that action to a button on the toolbar or attach that action to a menu item or a, a key press if you have a key press customizer here. 
Um, actually, Eclipse has a pretty nice one too. So I just went to Window Preferences and then General Keys. They're doing something similar here where we have all these commands listed. You choose what commands you want. You type in what type of key binding you want for it. And then it creates a key binding object behind the scenes that, when pressed, executes that action to create new instances of that command. So a lot of these have icons next to it. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't put it in a command object, I'd put it in the action. Okay. Uh, so what you do is in your action, let me actually, there's an action interface in Swing that's meant for this type of purpose. And the action interface in Swing has a few extra things inside of it. So he implements action, which just has the, well, it has all these methods in here. Let me go back to him for a minute. Uh, action performed is the what to do. And then it has this get value and put value, which allows you to add attributes to it. And the attributes that they support are defined inside here. So name, short description, long description, small icon, at command key, accelerator key, mnemonic key, selected key. I don't know what that one is. Um, large icon. Um, each one of these guys here, this allows you to define a small icon and a large icon for it. And think of the action as being a little more on the user interface side and the command being on the model side. That's usually how I like to separate them out. The command shouldn't know about the user interface at all. All he cares about is, I got some data, I'm going to make some changes to a model. The action is responsible for, the user has done something, let me run a command. So this is more of an action side thing. So what Swing does is he actually lets you add in, oh, I want an icon. And then you can use this guy to display an action on a button. And the way the Swing works is if you define something that implements the sample action here, like let's say, I'm not going to bother with the, well, I'll implement abstract action, which keeps track of those values for us, or oh, extends it. I can get rid of my get value, put value, and all that stuff down there. And I can say, oh, no, it's put value. Um, I don't have any icons. I, it's been so long since I've done this in Swing, I can't remember how to set up the icons. I keep thinking how to do it in Android. Um, let's just put a short description on there. So what you do is you describe what you want, including icons and things like that. And in the GUI, All you need to do is say, throw a new button with a new instance of, what did I call it, sample action? Something like that. So when I run this, you'll see that the button comes up with the text foo on it. If you had defined an icon, the icon would show up on there as well. Um, I apologize for not remembering how to do it in Swing. I used to do it, uh, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, God, Java's been out forever now, hasn't it? Uh, but I used to teach Java full-time, and that's something that we used to do is set these actions up, and you could just throw it on a toolbar, you could throw it on a menu, and it automatically sucks the data out. So it gives you a little more separation. You don't have to worry so much about how do I set up a menu, how do I set up a button. You just define an action for what I want to do, and then throw it on the toolbar, throw it on a menu, throw it in a button, whatever you want to do with it, or attach it to a key press. Um, so that gives you a lot of support for things like that. So defining it this way helps separate out, again, the what's on the user interface side and the, and the how I want to actually define the, uh, modify the model behind the scenes. Okay, questions on that? Any other questions? 
Okay, thanks for coming. Um, next time, I can't remember what uh, the one is next time, and I can't get on the network here to check. Uh, but take a look. Um, how did you guys find out about this, by the way? Okay, so it's like I, you know, I did. Um, anybody on the software dev list or the Java users lists? So that's one place I do it. There's also the Java users group on Cooler. So if you're on there, I send notes there. Um, and the uh, App Central list, the App, Sep App Central group on Cooler. Um, so if you go to the App Central group, it actually has a list of the whole schedule for what I'm planning on doing for all these and what's coming when. Um, but the video for this will be at this website here. So if you, if you just go to javadude.com, and from there, you can just go to Articles, and then Design Pattern Brown Bag Series. And then it's going to list that the new video and the new uh, uh, GitHub section for it. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thanks for coming. Hope to see you next time.